Okay. Well, good morning. And thank you for joining us for the Center for Railroad Photography and Arts second online conference, Virtual Conversations Fall Edition. And it sure feels like fall in our home of Madison today. I'm Scott Lotus, President and Executive Director of the Center. And on behalf of our Board of Directors and staff members, welcome. We're so glad you've decided to spend the day with us. We had originally planned to be at Stories, Connecticut today for the second edition of Conversations Northeast. Our host will defend the archives and special collections of the University of Connecticut Library in their beautiful Thomas J. Dodd Research Center, which we so greatly enjoyed at our first Northeastern themed conference back in 2016. Laura Smith, their archivist, is still joining us today. And this afternoon, she will share some digital selections from the extensive railroad holdings at the Yukon Archives. We're now planning to host our next Conversations Northeast Conference on Saturday, October 2nd, 2021 at the University of Connecticut's Dodd Center. Mark your calendars and plan to join us there. In the meantime, we will continue to bring the railroad photography and art you love by every means available to us. Our mission at the Center for Railroad Photography and Art is to preserve and present significant images of railroading. While the circumstances of the past several months have challenged all of us, we stayed as busy as ever at the Center. But thanks to the wonders of digital communication and the flexibility and devotion of our incredible staff and interns, we've continued to advance every aspect of our mission. Our biggest pivot has been hosting online events like this one. We started with our annual Conversations Conference in April, and we've continued with at least one session every month since then. All of these presentations, and nearly 20 of them so far, are available at no charge on our YouTube channel. You can find that at youtube.com slash railphotoart. We'll eventually post all of today's sessions there as well, and we're planning additional content through the fall and into the winter. Our next session will be our virtual Oktoberfest on Tuesday, October 6th, beginning at 7 p.m. U.S. Central Time. John Kelly will take you on a tour of the Milwaukee Roads Beer Line, exploring the history of railroads and beer in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, with photographs from our archive and other collections. We hope you can pour yourself a cold one and tune in for that. The person working behind the scenes to make these events happen is Haley Page, our exhibitions and events coordinator, who's learned a whole lot about video conferencing in a very short time. We're all still learning, so we ask your patience with any technical difficulties, and we welcome your feedback. It's especially helpful if you can provide us with screenshots showing any problems you might encounter. When you have questions today, for any of us at the center or for any of our presenters, you have two options for sending them. You can use either the Q&A or the chat functions in WebEx. You access both of those by clicking on the wrap buttons at the bottom middle of your screen. We'll open the Q&A and chat screens on the right-hand side of your screen, where you can type your message and select the recipient. We recommend you select all panelists to ensure that someone sees your message. You also have a few different options for how to view the presentations today, and you can cycle through them by clicking on the circular buttons in the upper right-hand corner of the main window for WebEx. Now, in addition to our online programming, we've also been busy with our publications. The fall issue of our quarterly journal, Railroad Heritage, is just off the press, and it is our longest of all time, 84 pages. The cover story is a true community effort, showcasing your responses to our call for submissions about how you've been staying engaged with railroad photography and art during the pandemic. There's some beautiful and inspiring work in these pages. There's even more beauty and inspiration in the winners of our 2020 John E. Gruber Creative Photography Awards, which you can also find in the fall issue of Railroad Heritage, as well as on our website. We'll be announcing the theme for the 2021 awards program later this year. Stay tuned for that. We've also published a new book, The Railroad Photography of Donald W. Furler. This is just off the press, and in fact, copies have just arrived in our warehouse a couple of days ago. Uh, this is uh, an incredible examination of Furler's steam era action shots of railroading in the Northeast. You can purchase it on our website and view my presentation about it on our YouTube channel. If you've pre-ordered a copy, we should be able to begin shipping those this coming week. Now, the Furler book 
like so many of our projects, draws upon the collections in our Railroad Heritage Visual Archive. We now have more than 400,000 photographs in our care, double the number of just a few years ago. The person in charge of managing this growth is our archivist, Adrian Evans. I'm going to turn over the screen to her in just a few moments to tell you more about our collections work. First though, I'd like to say a few words of thanks. Everything we do at the center is made possible by our community of members and supporters. Two of them, Michael Schmidt from our board of directors and the Tom E. Daly Foundation made special gifts this year to cover the costs of our initial subscription to WebEx events, the platform we use to host all of our online presentations. This is the first time we've charged the registration fee for any of our online programming. So if you're tuning in right now, you're already part of our community of supporters. Thank you. These fees, which we have tried to keep modest, help ensure the sustainability of our programming. And we are especially heartened that 37 of you made additional gifts to become patrons of this conference. Patron level gifts help us keep our overall registration fees low. Thank you all very much. There are many ways you can support our work, from your annual memberships to joining our Form 19 Legacy Society by pledging a gift from your estate. Inga Velton, our development director, would be happy to talk with you and answer any of your questions. You can reach her today through the chat function or anytime by phone or email. No matter how you give, it will help us further our mission of preserving and presenting significant images of railroading. Each one of the 13 members of our board of directors supports our work mightily, volunteering their time and talents to propel us forward in all that we do. We have a truly phenomenal board chaired by Bond French and spanning a wide range of experience and expertise. And most of our board members are tuning in now and several of them will be introducing our presenters throughout the day. Right now, it's my great pleasure to introduce Adrian Evans, our archivist, who is here to tell you more about our preservation work. Adrian joined our staff in 2017, following positions at History Colorado in Denver and the Image Permanence Institute in Rochester, New York. She is a native of South Dakota, but this is her second time living in Madison, as she received her master's degree from the University of Wisconsin's School of Library and Information Studies. She brings to us her passion for historic photography, as well as great knowledge about how to care for it, and she's learned quite a bit about railroads in her three years with us. Her favorite locomotives are streamlined diesels, and she favors the lines of Electromotive's E and F units. Won't you please give a warm virtual welcome to our archivist, Adrian Evans. Hi, can you hear me? Loud and clear, and awesome. give me just a moment and I will give you the presenter baton and you can take it away. Sounds great. All right, I've got it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. All right, can you see my desktop? Looks good. All right, so let's get started. Um, hi, I'm Adrienne Evans, uh, the Archivist at the Center for Railroad Photography and Art. Um, if you've ever attended conversations, requested an image from one of our collections, or interacted with our social media accounts, you're probably familiar with me and what I do at the center. Uh, but for first timers, uh, my job is to manage the preservation of our holdings, facilitate access to our images and supervise our growing collection staff um, who honestly take on the brunt of our processing work. Uh, we currently hold images in the numbers of the hundreds of thousands in our permanent collections and the majority of them are digitized. Uh, you're likely familiar with some of our artists and photographers, such as Jim Shaughnessy and John Gruber, and some may be new to you. Uh, we have a lot of vernacular photographers and talented hobbyists represented in the collections, such as Fred Springer and Leo King. Uh, you can find a complete list of our collections and finding aids to them on our website. And to get us started here, um, here are uh, some Boston and Maine bud cars at uh, Troy, New York, uh, and this was shot by Jim Shaughnessy on December 14th, 1956. Um, so the biggest news with collections is always uh, their growth at the center. 
Uh, I have some interesting updates uh, this time around with new data uh, from the last few months. Um, in the spring, I projected I projected that we'd reach over uh, 360,000 images in our permanent holdings this year. Uh, but we've already smashed through that projection, actually. Um, and now our archive currently holds approximately 460,000 images, with potentially 19,000 more set to arrive before 2021. Uh, there have been several new arrivals to the archive over the last spring and summer. Uh, we've received collections or portions of collections by Jim McClellan and David Maney. And also, uh, quite significantly, the John Gruber collection has arrived. Um, and this is a large collection comprised of over 109,000 images, and we actually did not expect it to arrive so soon, uh, but it's great, and it's contributed greatly to our collection's growth spurt. Uh, so we're now on track to hit uh, 671,000 images in 2021 and the years following, and that's not counting uh, potential collections up for review by our Collections and Acquisitions Committee in the next few months. Um, and just to give you kind of a visual representation of how much uh, we've grown, um, here you can see on this slide in the upper left-hand corner, um, our archival storage space when we first moved in a little less than a year ago. And below is the current state of the space, uh, not full, but it, it's much more filled out. Uh, not to worry though, this is just one room in our suite of three, and it's comprised of 1,400 square feet of storage so we're not out of space yet. Um, and also while we're here, a few more important collection related news items. Uh, first, we've been making uh, great progress towards the goals we set as part of a five-year grant that we received from the Elizabeth Morris Charitable Trust last year. Uh, with support from the grant, we're looking to launch a more robust online collections portal uh, that will give you all greater access to our images. Uh, we recently selected a consultant, Margo Note, uh, who will assist with the selection of the system. Uh, and we will be looking to get input on what features you all might like to see in a new collections portal. Uh, so stay tuned for more information about this to come out over the next few months. So obviously uh, we'll be quite busy for the foreseeable future. Uh, there are large significant collections to process like John Gerber's, which is pictured here with his son, Dick, who was a great help in transferring the collection to the archives. Um, for folks who don't know, uh, processing a collection at the center involves arranging, rehousing, and cataloging items in the collection. We also typically include digitization as part of the tasks. Uh, processing can be quite time consuming depending on how the collections arrive, um, which can be in various stages of organization. Uh, we've kind of seen it all. Um, and illustrative of that point is the image in the lower right hand corner of the slide. Um, a recent acquisition uh, from a photographer that I'm, I'm not going to name, um, and I should mention that this container is just one small part of an otherwise well-organized collection. Uh, so, speaking of processing, uh, we're currently doing it and we're doing a lot of it, um, and this was not always the case this year. Um, at the start of the pandemic, everybody was locked down and we did not have access to the collections in our archive. Uh, but we've uh, moved back into our offices, obviously at a much lower capacity than before the pandemic. Um, one staff member and one or two assistants are usually in the office on any given day. Uh, but the rest of the time, uh, we're still working a lot from home. So when we're in the office, we try to social distance. Uh, as you can see here, Angel and Wesley both work in separate processing rooms right now. And uh, one is a makeshift processing room um, that, that will be returned to exhibits after the pandemic is over. Uh, so we're aiming to keep doing what we do while still keeping our staff as safe as possible. And now I'd like to show um, some of the fruits of our labors, uh, some newly processed images. Uh, we began working on Jim Shaughnessy's film negatives earlier this summer. There are 60,000 negatives in the collection. So we put two collection staff members on digitizing and rehousing the materials, uh, Natalie Kresik and Wesley Sondheim. Uh, the negatives are arranged alphabetically by railroad name, and we're close to completing the A series and the B series of the images. Uh, these series include Shaughnessy's images of railroads, such as Amtrak, the Argent Lumber Company, 
the Boston and Maine, Baltimore and Ohio, and many more. And uh, just an FYI, that's why you'll only be seeing images of railroads that begin with A and B as part of the selection. So here we see one of Shaughnessy's classic night shots, and I'm totally a sucker for these. Um, this is uh, Boston and Maine GP9 units, units at uh, Mechanicville, New York. Uh, the caption information did not actually include a date for this image, so we'll need to do a little more research on our end. Also, if you recognize it and you know the date, please let me know, and I, I'm, I'm sure you will. Um, we've also processed a group of images in the Shaughnessy collection of the Argent Lumber Company. Um, the locomotives, which are narrow gauge wood burning locomotives, along with uh, Shaughnessy's candid shots of the workers, uh, have been a point of fascination for many of the collection staff. Um, and here's an image Shaughnessy shot in Hardyville, South Carolina, uh, in the early months of 1956. Um, and here's another one of the Argent Lumber Company that we particularly like. Uh, there's kind of a little slice of life feeling as two employees converse in one of the wood burning locomotives. Um, and this image was taken during the same time period as the previous one I just shared. Um, and finally, here's a Shaughnessy image from our B series. It's one that you may be actually familiar with, uh, but I couldn't resist sharing this image, I love the drama of the light and the steam. Um, so I hope you're not sick of seeing it. Um, but this is uh, Baltimore and Ohio steam locomotives, number 1624 and 4469 at Connellsville, Pennsylvania on June 30th, 1956. In addition to Shaughnessy, uh, the collection staff have also been hard at work on the David Meany collection. Uh, in total, it's comprised of about 19,000 images, um, and David sent the first batch of 2,000 images uh, earlier this year. Um, and it documents real operations in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic United States uh, with some coverage of the Midwest, South, and Canada. Um, so the first batch we received came mostly digitized, which has been a huge help. Um, so we put one of our archives assistants, Angel, on uh, rehousing the negatives in archival safe sleeves and um, also uh, numbering the images based on the center's numbering uh, system. And here we see uh, Delaware and Hudson pushers on what looks to be a cold night in Stillwater, Pennsylvania. And Maney shot this image on December 27th, 1951. Uh, we're currently scouring the collections for some Christmas card photos, and I think this would be a great contender. Um, and here's a personal favorite of mine from the Maney collection. Um, this is the Edaville Railroad. Uh, it's a heritage line. Um, and here's locomotive number three at South Harbor, Massachusetts on July 30th, 1952. Um, along with a boy who looks um, both uh, kind of proud to be there and also kind of possessive of the locomotive at the same time. And I, I like to think that this is kind of the quintessential uh, rail fan expression. Um, and it, it gives me a lot of joy every time I see this image. Um, and here's a classic shot for folks who love a good smoke plume. Uh, this is uh, Western Maryland Railway Number 1124, hauling westbound freight near Frostburg, Maryland, on October 11th, 1952. And uh, finally, I'm rounding out my mini selections with the Baltimore and Ohio. Um, here's number 4434 at Warwick, Ohio, on May 17th, 1958. Um, I always love uh, just the the scale of the locomotive kind of versus the people in the shot. I'm, I'm a sucker for images like that as well. Um, so next up, uh, we're just beginning processing uh, the 109,000 images in the John Gruber collection. Uh, this is a daunting task, but it's been made much more achievable by the efforts of Bonnie Gruber, uh, John's wife. Over the past couple of years, she's organized and created a database of John's print slides and negatives. Um, and this is an invaluable contribution to her efforts and I can't begin uh, to figure out how to properly thank her. And we'll be off to a running start with this collection, uh, thanks to all of her hard work. 
Uh, so we're just uh, starting to dig into the collection. So I'm going to be showing some of John's earliest images paired with some of his later photographs of similar locations. I think you'll get a sense of how John matured as a photographer as he sought out various ways to depict railroading. Um, there's also a bit, of, a bit of a theme of kind of beginnings and endings um, as many of the images uh, that John shot later in his life feature locomotives that are on their last runs. Um, and in these images, you will mostly see the Madison, Wisconsin area as it was one of John's main stomping grounds and it is the home of the center. And here we have a Chicago and Northwestern passenger train at their depot on South Blair Street in Madison, Wisconsin in the 1950s. Um, those of you who have seen our traveling exhibition faces of railroading may be familiar with some of this. Um, I thought I'd start by sharing one of John's earliest images, or at least one of the earliest images we have in the collection. Um, according to the caption, this Milwaukee Road steam locomotive was shot in the fall of 1948 in Prairie du Sac, Wisconsin, where John spent much of his childhood. Uh, John would have been about 12 years old when he created this image, and maybe it's not the most technically sophisticated image we've ever seen, but certainly you know, a great start to his uh, long career with railroad photography. Uh, and here's another early one from John. Uh, this is a Milwaukee Road local uh, headed east uh, at the Milwaukee Road Depot on Western Washington Avenue in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and I've circuit this 1950, uh, this particular locomotive number one uh, was the first of four built in 1935 for the Hiawatha that ran between Chicago and the Twin Cities. Uh, it was later bumped into local service by larger locomotives and it was scrapped in November of 1951. So likely shortly after this image was shot. And just to jump forward in time, um, here's one of John's images of a uh, Conductor Tom Burke helping passengers climb aboard a Milwaukee Road passenger train um, out of Madison on April 30th, 1971. Um, this would have been one of the last scheduled Milwaukee Road trains from Madison to Chicago. Uh, the next day, Amtrak assumed responsibility for most of the nation's passenger service and eliminated Madison from its route map. Um, and now we're jumping back to the beginning again. Um, this is a Chicago and Northwestern passenger train in Madison um, on June 23rd, 1951. Uh, John would have been about 15 years old when he shot this image. And jumping forward to the future of the CNW in Madison, um, here's one of John's images of a conductor and a ticket agent shaking hands in farewell um, as the last Chicago and Northwestern 400 passenger train uh, prepares to head west out of Madison um, in 1963. And that concludes some of the images um, that we've been working on. Um, if you'd like to reach out to us, uh, we're quite uh, active on social media. Um, you can also email us with any questions or comments or I guess if you're stuck in the mud, uh, we're always happy to help. Um, so thanks so much, guys. Thank you, Adrian. Yeah. Great stuff, and uh, I'm sure just a, a hint of the many gems to come in the in the Gruber collection. Oh yeah, it's it's gonna be great. No, that's that's exciting to see, and and great work to you and all of our collection staff on on keeping us moving at full speed ahead despite the unusual challenges we faced this year. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, for those of you who didn't know, you probably do now. Adrian recently got two new kittens, and uh, <laughs> I, I only wish we could harness their energy to help process our collections. <laughs> I didn't even think of it. <laughs> I, I, I enjoyed seeing them. I know one of them's name now is Magnus. Does the other one have a name yet? Uh, Sina. Sina and Magnus. All right. Well, uh, glad to have some cameo appearances on them today, too. All right. Let's see. I'm going to go ahead and get started now with some opening remarks for our international theme of uh, a lot of today's presentations. Uh, and so I think, as, as most of you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has really laid bare one of the great vulnerabilities of living in a time of such extensive global connections. 
Yet yeah, global connections bring about some truly extraordinary benefits too. At our first conference uh, back in April, we were struck by the number of attendees from other countries, including many who stayed up quite late or got up quite early in order to join us. Thanks to social media, I'm connected with railroad photographers from all over the world, and their work is every bit as incredible as what I see here in the United States. When we made the inevitable decision to take this conference online, we needed an almost all new slate of presenters. We decided to turn this into an opportunity to explore more of the world's railways and to meet some of the people who photograph them. We knew we would face some challenges in doing this. Scheduling presenters from so many different time zones added a new twist to our logistics and planning. Beyond that, we also knew it might be harder to promote this event. As railroad enthusiasts, we are nothing if not provincial. All of us, the world over, seem to favor our hometown railroads. The railroads themselves have encouraged this. In the early decades of the 20th century, the Great Northern Railway and many others extolled travelers to see Europe if you will, but see America first. When I graduated from college 18 years ago, I heeded their advice. I had no interest then in traveling abroad, so I celebrated with a big road trip through the American West. A few years later though, when the love of my life decided to teach English in Japan, I followed her. It turned out to be one of the best decisions I ever made. Love has compelled people from all over the world to leave the familiar and the comfortable and to strike out for unknown lands. For many railroad photographers, including Fred Springer, who's in our collections, it was the love of the steam locomotive. Steam lasted longer in many other parts of the world than it did here, and the romance of steam railroading drew American photographers across international boundaries. Often they found these places every bit as compelling as the locomotives they'd went to see. And there are quite a few examples of this in our collections here at the center. We just published a book about Don Furler's photography, and after his hometown railroads in the northeastern U.S. dropped the fires from the last of their steam locomotives, he headed north to Canada. And during one such visit in 1958, Furler rode in the cab of Canadian National Locomotive 6226. This is his photograph of that very engine pulling the Maple Leaf passenger train. The experience prompted him to send a letter of thanks to the CN's division superintendent. Furler wrote, each year I make several trips to Canada as a tourist, frankly, because I'm tremendously impressed by your country, its industry and atmosphere of getting things done, and because I have found Canadians to be very fine and friendly people. This visit was no exception. Ted Rose, who most of us know for his watercolors, was an avid photographer during his late teens and early 20s. He also went north to Canada, but when steam operations ended there in 1960, he headed south to Mexico, where steam continued for several more years. During the summers of 1960 and 1961, Ted made extended trips to Mexico with his friend Robert Ludwig. They spent four weeks south of the border on their first adventure, but they had a bit of a disagreement over the planning of their second trip. Robert shared one of Ted's letters with me, which Ted wrote in response to Robert's suggestion that they spend less time in Mexico and more time in the US. Ted would have none of that. On July 1st, 1961, Ted wrote to Robert, Howdy, regarding Mexico and such places, you were out of your mind. Fool around here another week while compounds abound and time runs out for a particular three-cylinder Pacific? Remain among GP9s when GR43s are to be found? Stay here while number 110 is narrow gauge and steam? Pass up Udayy Ancients and slight Apizaco on an inadequate trip? Great hat, my good man. Such a trip would be somewhat of a travesty. Let us add another week. Note the obvious improvements. There followed Ted's proposed itinerary for five weeks in Mexico that August and September. He ended up staying for six weeks. Ted's photographs from Mexico are his best work with a camera, providing ample evidence of his great artistic talent, which he would tap fully when he turned to brushes and water-soluble pigments. If I've piqued your interest in Ted Rose, good. As we continue our online programming into the fall and winter, 
We're planning a presentation about Ted and his work in conjunction with the Colorado Railroad Museum, which is currently hosting our Ted Rose Traveling Exhibition, seen here with Andy Cummings, one of our members. Stay tuned. <clears throat> our collection with the greatest depth of international coverage is surely Victor Hands. Thanks to the tremendous efforts of our archives team, and especially Natalie Kresik, we've digitized all 46,000 of Victor's negatives with his tremendous support. These photographs provide an incredible window into the world's railways during the second half of the 20th century. Much like Ted Rose and several others, Victor began with trips to Canada and Mexico in search of steam locomotives. And also like Ted, Victor grew quite fond of the railways there and also the people. Ask Victor if he has a favorite among his 46,000 photographs, and he will respond without hesitation that it's this one inside the Valle de Mexico Roundhouse on the night of December 1st, 1962. By the mid-1960s, though, steam was on the wane in Mexico. While some American railroad photographers made their peace with the diesel, Ted Rose and many others stopped photographing altogether. Victor Hand, however, was just getting started. With both the means and the inclination to travel overseas, Victor set out to find steam locomotives far beyond North American soil. He began where many Americans make their first trip abroad, in England, where he found steam still in abundance in the mid-1960s, and where he made what is possibly the finest photographic record by any non-British photographer of the final years of regular steam operations on the British railways. Over the ensuing decades, Victor has traveled all over the world's six inhabited continents. His photography, published widely in Trains Magazine and a number of books, helped introduce the world's railways to American audiences. When Trains published a lengthy article by Victor featuring Africa's legendary Garrett steam locomotives, editor David P. Morgan wrote, finally, a photographer worthy of the task. Yet Victor still longed for the hometown railroad of his youth, the New York Central. To Morgan's praise, Victor replied, I would trade every Garrett in Africa to see one Hudson running at speed. Well, that might be true, Morgan told his readers, but the Garrett is better for Victor Hand having photographed it. And so are we. You can learn a lot about a country and its culture by studying its railroads, as I learned while living in Japan. Japan, excuse me. Japan's railways are profoundly different from their American counterparts. Like contemporary railways throughout much of Asia as well as Europe, Japan's railways focus on moving people quickly, efficiently, and punctually. For me, this took some getting used to at first. I grew up in West Virginia, where I marveled at hundred car coal trains slogging up steep mountain grades with engines on the front and rear in full throttle. And I certainly didn't see anything like that in Japan. One of my first train rides in Japan took me from the Kobe airport into Kyoto. From the front of the first car, I could look through a window over the driver's shoulder at the scene unfolding in front of me, a narrow gauge, electrified, four track main line. Passenger trains of all shapes and sizes flashed by every few minutes, sometimes two at once. It was as compelling of a railroad landscape as any I have ever seen, fully embodying the term metropolitan corridor, coined by Harvard professor John R. Stilgo to describe American railroads. The railroads of the United States and Japan could hardly be more different, and yet they both ride on the same basic principle, the flanged wheel on the steel rail. But the same technology could be harnessed to build two systems so vastly unlike is an incredible testament to the great power and flexibility of the railroad. Yet it's not just the differences that are fascinating. Marine and I lived on Japan's northern island of Hokkaido. It was the last place in Japan to host regular steam operations, which lasted until the end of 1975. I have since discovered that Victor Hand visited many of the same places that I went to photograph Hokkaido's railways. He made this view of two locomotives pulling and pushing a freight train over Karakachi Pass in the mountains of central Hokkaido 
1966. And five years later, he caught a D-52 steaming south along Volcano Bay at Rayburn, very close to where Marine and I would later live in Muraran. Since 1988, the 33-mile Seikon Tunnel has provided a direct rail connection between Hokkaido and Honshu, Japan's main island. This is my photograph of a limited express train from Palmori exiting the Seikon Tunnel and entering Hokkaido in 2007. When I lived in Japan, several sleeping car trains ran every night between Hokkaido's capital of Sapporo and the big cities in Honshu. Anytime Marine and I visited Sapporo, I tried to go to the main railway station whenever those trains were scheduled to arrive or depart. On this particular day, I walked down to the end of the platform to admire the blue and gold DD-51 diesel hydraulic locomotives on the Hokutose, an overnight train bound for Tokyo. The young driver was busy going through his departure preparations, and at first glance, he looked nothing like a traditional American engineer. He sat on the left side of the cab, he wore an aviator's hat, a crisp dress shirt, and clean white gloves. Yet as he gently eased his 12-car train into motion, he looked not at the tracks in front of him, but at the ground directly below him. Like any veteran steam-era American hogger in blue denim overalls, this young Japanese driver in clean white gloves looked down at the ground while he started his train. In that moment, the Pacific Ocean evaporated as did all the differences of railroading beyond its far shores. I could have been standing at any station in the U.S. watching any American engineer ease his train into motion by looking down at the ground. That young Japanese driver was part of the same family of railroaders. Railroads connect us, not just within our own countries, but across borders, across oceans, across cultures. The Swiss, Keepers of the Alpine passes at the crossroads of Europe understand this as well as anyone. On a recent trip to Switzerland's Ration Railway, I came across an exhibit about the construction of the new Albula Tunnel, which included this sign. It's a grid of 56 triangular blocks, arranged seven across by eight down. Viewers can turn the blocks to any of their three sides. One features contemporary photographs while another combines to form a single historic image of the workers who built the first Albula Tunnel, which opened in 1903. On their third side, the blocks present a message in seven different languages, German, Romance, Italian, French, English, Japanese, and Arabic. What language do you speak? Languages form the basis of our identity. Identity is what characterizes our cultures. The railway connects these cultures. Guests and guest workers get to know these cultures. Getting to know each other creates understanding. Understanding is the basis of tolerance. It's the basis of peace. So in the spirit of cultural understanding, and maybe even tolerance and peace, let us embark on today's virtual journey of railways around the world.